Cliff's name on it, and I put all my bills in there too. So just take care of those where you get. Well, yeah, well, call smart. Like I said, if you're smart, you call smart. Yeah. Okay, and then you also have a national day of prayer uh, here that's been uh, handed out by our brother right here, and that's going to be on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, right? So, uh, okay, so it's, it's at noon for a brief time of prayer, and then there's a full program at 6 o'clock, right? Okay, at uh, Sunken Gardens in Atascadero, right? Who's it, ultimate, who's it sponsored by? Okay, great. National Day of Prayer. Now, also, uh, just business-wise, so today is the 23rd. Next week is the 30th. Then we have May 7th. So for the next two weeks, we're actually not meeting because we have an extra Saturday. So, so we will convene on the 14th of May. Okay? Are you with me? Nobody's with me. Okay. Well, for those of you who are with me, of course, if you want to come on those days, you can come. Nobody will be here, but, I, you know, you'll, you'll come. Scott will be here with coffee and donuts. All right. Let me, let me open up in prayer, and then uh, we'll begin. Father in heaven, thank you for the truthfulness of your word, and thank you for the scriptures that you've given to us, Father. What a beautiful, beautiful testimony of who you are, a revelation of who you are. And I thank you for the clearness of the word. I thank you that we can see you in the scriptures, Father. So please, as we open our eyes to study more of the doctrine of the word of God and the authority and its inerrancy, Father, that you would open our eyes to behold wonderful things. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, if you've got last week's uh, then I'm just going to hit a few points on there to get to where we left off. The first thing that I want you to see is, I think, on the very first page where it says explanation and scriptural basis. The authority of scripture means that all the words of scripture are God's words in such a way that to disbelieve or disobey any word of scripture is to disobey and disbelieve in God. Right? That's, that's huge. This is, our, this is our standard, our guide for faith and practice right here. Not, I'm not saying that the Bible only addresses faith and practice, but what I'm saying is that every issue it addresses, we need to follow God's word and place our faith and trust in what he said. Because it's all God's inspired word. Later on, a little bit under A, the Bible claims for itself to be God's word. There's hundreds of places in Scripture where it says, thus says the Lord. And so if it says, thus says the Lord, that's you know that's God's word, don't you? Because it's a, it's a literal quote there. It's like saying, the king says, only this is the king of all authority in Scripture. And we also looked at that when a prophet spoke, a prophet was to declare God's word. And if he was a false prophet, boy, we got false prophets out there today, don't we? And uh, to, when, you, when, you are, when you are speaking the word of God as a prophet and those in that prophetic gift, they had to speak truth. And so even the words of a prophet were considered God's word. So to disbelieve anything that a prophet that was true from the Lord was considered to be disobedient. So just that thought alone, those two early thoughts constitute the largest section from the Old Testament, right? That doesn't mean everything in the Old Testament is covered just yet. We'll explain that. Oh, by the way, in case you're wondering about PowerPoint, the bulb here is out, uh, it, you know, and we'll have it fixed on Monday. So I usually have a PowerPoint to go with this. So you'll just have to look up. You, did you bring your Bible? Have you got an electronic copy of your Bible or whatever? Okay, good, good. He's, okay, come see Scott. He'll straighten you out. He'll, he'll buy you a, he'll buy you a, a, a $75 study Bible absolutely free if you just come see him. Okay. That's pretty, he, he's a nice guy, isn't he? 2 Second Tim, Second Timothy 3.16. Turn there. Remember we talked about this? What did we say? We said that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, right? Pasa all with the 
Freedom Mart, Grappe, okay, Pasa Grappe, that is the Greek word there. It, pi looks like uh, our letter P. If, you're, if you ever graduated from fraternity, you know what I'm talking about. A is Alpha, Sigma, Pasa, right? Pasa Grappe. And this term here, Grappe, we get from graphic or whatever. <coughs> G-R-A-P-H-E, if you want to put it into English spelling. All scripture, and what if you remember what we said about this term, what, what did we say about this term grafe here? Do you remember? It's a technical term. It becomes a technical term. It's used throughout God's word many, many times. And it tells you that it's saying all scripture. So, though this is the New Testament, it's looking back on the Old Testament, and it's saying all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. In fact, look at verse 15. From, uh, and from childhood you have known the, what? Holy Scriptures or sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. And then all scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and correction, for instruction, that the man of God might be thoroughly equipped unto every good work. So, these sacred writings are literally breathed out by God. Then we said in 1 Peter, turn over to 1 Peter, if you will, because he's going to make a very powerful statement. He's going to make a reference, if you will, to what Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says what? Anybody got it? Is it 2 Peter? Yo, you're right, 2 Peter. You're probably thinking you had another translation. What's going on here? Okay, 2 Peter 1, 21. Okay, who's going to read it? Right. So you see it very clearly in the text, don't you? It's not of one's private interpretation. It's from the will of God. But then he follows it up with 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. So listen to the word, 2 Peter 3, 15. And regard to the patience of our Lord to be salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. So now he's talking about Paul, who is writing New Testament letters. Watch this. As also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things in which some things are hard to understand, which the untaught right, try to un or they're unstable and try to distort the rest of what? Scripture for their own destruction. There he is calling the writings of Paul Scripture. So if all Scripture is given by inspiration, and Peter is referring to Paul as being an inspired writer of the gospel, then you, or uh, the New Testament 13 letters that he wrote, this all Scripture is going to take into context the fullness of the Old Testament and the New Testament. It is all God breathed. Verse, 1 Corinthians 14.37, we're just reviewing right now. 1 Corinthians 14.37, and anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are what? A commandment of the Lord. So, we're stepping back, we're looking at this, and we're saying, hey, here's what the point is teaching. That all scripture is given by God, it's inspired by God, it's his holy word. And to disobey it or not to acknowledge any of it, this doesn't mean that we understand it perfectly. It doesn't mean that we're capable of grasping everything it says. But the things that we can grasp and hold on to are certainly given to us by God for our growth. Amen? Amen. All right. So here's where I think we left off. On point number two, we are convinced the Bible claims to be God's word as we read the Bible. Do you see it there? Four or five pages in? Okay. 
So you have the Bible itself claiming to be the Word of God. Now, the second testimony that we have that the Bible is the Word of God is that when we are reading God's Word, we are reading the very words of God, and you have within you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is testifying to what you're reading so that you can understand and know that this is God's Word. Look what it says. Our ultimate conviction that the words of the Bible are God's words comes only when the Holy Spirit in us and through the words of the Bible to our hearts gives us inner assurance that these are the words of our Creator speaking to us. In other words, apart from the Spirit of God, you, you can't really understand this. And so when, when, when you give somebody a, a, a Bible and you say, read it, and they begin to read the Bible, how many times have you had somebody say, I, I can't, I, I don't understand this. It's not making any sense to me at all. I picked it up, I looked at it, I read it, I can't figure out what it's saying. And they're right. The natural man, Paul says in Second Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. He cannot understand them. They're foolishness to him. He's spiritually discerned. So the only way that you can read this book and understand what the book is saying is through the Spirit of God applying it to your heart. And that is part of what we call the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. You see, our faith is not just found right here in the written word, but we have a person, the Holy Spirit, Christ himself dwelling within us so that when we read the scriptures, we get a conviction of understanding that this is the word of God. Jesus said these words in John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, right? And I know them, and they follow me. John 10, 27. So we're his sheep. We hear his voice. 27. We hear his voice as his sheep, and we follow him. That's what it, this is all about. So it's important to remember that this conviction, that the words of Scripture are the very words of God, does not come apart from the words of Scripture or in addition to the words of Scripture. So we're not adding anything, we're not taking anything away, but rather as we read Scripture, we hear the Creator's voice, God Himself, speaking to this because this is His Word. And if this is His Word, He's going to use His Word. So you can see clearly right here, without number one, without being saved, you're not going to understand the message of what's being said. And number two, if you're not reading the, the, the Word of God, how are you going to grow spiritually? You can't. It's absolutely impossible. That's why I say, you know, don't go to a church that isn't preaching and teaching God's Word. Go to a church that is actually opening up the book, explaining the meaning of the text, and applying it to your life. That's what you need and the most part of your life, right? So, we, uh, we need to understand something. Do I have a footnote in there about neo-orthodoxy? Negative? Okay, so let me just simply say this. Neo-orthodoxy, for those of you who haven't heard of that term, it's a term that is used today, and it was done by a man by the name of Karl Barth, who was a, a German uh, of over 100 years ago. And the man wrote, and this is what he said. He said, while everybody was denying the authority of scriptures, all the theologians were, he stood up and he said, no, 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 this is God's word, but it only becomes God's word when you read it and you get something out of it. Now, that's not the same thing we're saying. We're saying it's all God's word. Whether I read it and I'm confused or I misunderstand it, it's still God's word. It doesn't matter. I mean, it matters what I get out of it, but what I get out of it isn't determining the factor of whether or not it's God's Word. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah, you've got that. And so please understand that this is His authoritative Word. So, think about this. When you're sharing Christ and you're witnessing to somebody, you're telling them, you're giving them your testimony, you know? So, I grew up, and as I grew up, I got saved when I was nine years old. I was an old-fashioned Baptist church, you know, and 
the, the invitation was given. Dr. Proppy was the preacher that day. He was a, a, an interim pastor. As we were looking for a new pastor. And he was a faithful man to the Word of God. World War II vet. Used to walk with two canes because he suffered a grenade injury in World War II. And he was preaching the gospel on a Sunday night. And I said, I want Christ. And I walked the aisle at the end at the invitation. I remember he prayed with me. And right then and there, I received Jesus Christ. Now, when I talk to people about my testimony and, and people listen to what I have to say about how I was saved and how I got converted, I used to think, oh, my testimony is so blah. I mean, I wasn't in the mafia. I, you know, I hadn't murdered people. Uh, I wasn't living on the streets as a, as a, as a drug addict. I, I wasn't a pimp. I didn't have any of those these horrific stories that just glorify everything that you've done. All I can say to people is, well, I got saved when I was nine years old. Doesn't sound very exciting, doesn't it? But listen to me. Your testimony is not what saves people. Your testimony is the result of what God has done for you. Your testimony is the result of the gospel. But your testimony is not the gospel. That's why if you're witnessing to somebody, it's okay to share your testimony. Absolutely, what Christ did for you. But if you don't get down to the words of Scripture that, A, you're a sinner, B, you need to repent, Jesus died for your sins and bled for them, and the wrath of God for your sin was placed upon him, and he arose from the grave, and he has sent his Holy Spirit. If you don't lay out the gospel, you're not witnessing. You are just giving them your personal testimony, which is good. I'm not saying don't give personal testimony. I think you should. But even if you don't have an exciting testimony, you have to understand you have all the tools right here to share Christ with somebody. Amen? And far too often we want to, we want to say, this is what God did for me. Well, you know, my life was a ruin and blah, blah, blah. And now I'm healthy, happy, and blah, 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 blah. And that's all good, but that doesn't redeem anybody, right? You have got to be able to hear the voice of God from the Word of God speaking to you because it's God's Word that redeems you. It's God's words that quicken the dead man, make him alive, just as God spoke his word and the world was created. So God today has given us his word. So when I'm witnessing to somebody, what I want to do is I want to leave them with a scripture. I want to leave them with God's word. I want It's not just what he did for me. I want them to hear the very words of God. Because what's going to convict them down the road? Not me. They're not going to come back and say, you know, when you said you were nine years old and you walked the aisle, that just changed my life. No, what changed my life is the Spirit of God quickened me, made me alive in Christ. I was born again, and I understood what His Word was saying. So we all want to do that. We all want to make sure that we do that, okay? Uh-huh. Yes. Right. To... Yep. Right. Any questions about what I'm saying? I hope you don't misunderstand what I'm saying and walk away and say, oh, my testimony is not important. No, it's important. And it's great to share that with people. But you've got to go beyond that to God's Word. Your testimony needs to include those verses. Absolutely. As you your testimony. Yep. Before I can the point of faith that you're walking in now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Right. So if I was sharing my testimony, I would say my pastor was preaching and what he was saying about sin was being proclaimed. And what he was saying is that all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And that convicted me because I realized that I was a sinner and God was saying to me that I am a sinner. So I could give my testimony but I'm going to weave the Word of God into that because that's what has the impact. 
So I'm not saying don't give your testimony. I'm saying when you think about your testimony, you should plan to put the Word of God instilled in that so that they hear the Word of God and they understand. Okay? And, and one of the things that we will cover is what is the gospel? Because I think we have got a tremendous misunderstanding in the world out there today about what the gospel is. Because when I listen on TV or I see these popular preachers that are real good speakers, a lot of them aren't talking about the gospel, right? The gospel is you're a sinner. Christ died for your sins. You must confess with your mouth and believe that God hath raised him from the dead. Then you'll be saved. Amen? Okay, so look at number three. So we're talking about, is this the authoritative word of God? Yes, it is. The, the word itself says it's authoritative. Someone might say that's a circular argument. I'll come back to that in a moment. The second evidence that we have is the internal working of the Holy Spirit, which is called uh, the internal testimony of the Spirit. The Spirit will convict you, right? That's what the Lord says. Here's the other evidence that we have. Other evidence, it's useful, but it's not finally convincing what i mean is here is that it is historically accurate the word of god is it's internally consistent it contains prophecies that have been fulfilled hundreds of years later this book has influenced the course of human history it's changed millions and billions of lives and it is unmatched by any other book or work that has ever been done because it is God's word. So you will get people who will say to you, I don't believe that's God's word. I don't believe that this is true. I think there are errors in here. Of course, when they say that, what, what, what I, my response is always this. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, which section are you referring to? What verse? What, what chapter? Show me where that error is. I want to find that. Well, you know, and they'll either Google it online and try to find somebody who agrees with their point of view and tries to point something out, and it's usually something that is so misunderstood or insignificant that they don't, they don't really grasp what it's being said. Yeah, but it's their excuse, right? All it is is an excuse, and we're trying to tell them this is God's word and this is the truth, right? So all of these arguments taken individually, or together don't ultimately prove that this is God's word because, turn to number four, is number four on your page there? The words of scripture are self-attesting. In other words, they cannot be proved or appealed to by any higher authority because this is the highest authority. See, when, whenever you... When, everybody, some, when somebody is trying to prove something, what do they point to? They, they point to a higher authority, don't they? Like, for instance, the earth is getting warmer. We're in the middle of global warming. And, how do, and you say, well, how do you know that? And they say what? Science. They, they, they say, look at the science. Science proves that. Right? Well, is in our world, in our generation... Science is kind of the highest authority. In one sense, everybody looks at the secular world what scientists agree. But absolutely, here's the problem with that. Not all scientists agree. In fact, there is a tremendous... How many times were you told to wear a mask, to not wear a mask, to wear a mask, to not wear a mask? I mean, I'm certain there are benefits to it, but the government has done a horrible job, and then the government says... It's based on reality. It's based on science. Well, science is our understanding of how things work. It doesn't mean we have the right understanding. So somewhere there has to be a higher authority. And what we're saying is that ultimately the highest authority is the word of God. Why? Because it's God's breath. It's God's word. It's equal with God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Drop down to verse 13. The Word became flesh and walked among us. It's our Lord Jesus Christ, is it not? These are His words. So you might say, well, Pastor Mike, that's a, that's a circular argument. You are using 
this as a circular argument. You are saying that this is God's word, and to prove to you it's God's word, here's God's word. And that doesn't make sense to a lot of people. In fact, if we say that Scripture is God's word because it claims that, they say that circular argument. And if we believe it claims because the Scripture is God's word, and if we believe that it's God's word because it claims to be that, and goes on, so forth and so on, this is kind of a circular argument. And I would say, yeah, it's kind of a circular argument because every argument has to have an ultimate authority. The question is, is what is your ultimate authority? And when people say that this is not God's word, what they're saying is my reason is my ultimate authority. What I believe about this is my ultimate authority. Or in our world of secular pluralism today, they will say things like, well, that's your truth. That's your truth. You have to find your truth. My truth is something different. I'm seeking my own truth. But what, what, what is that? That's nothing more than a, an argument that's saying all reason and what I believe is true stops with me. And so therefore, whatever I believe and whatever I think is correct is what it needs to be. And this is the secular reasoning today. So if I get up today and I feel like I'm not a boy, I'm a girl, I can ultimately say to myself, my truth is I'm a girl. And so in today's world, you now have to dress me with feminine pronouns because I think I'm a girl. And I could say to them, wait a minute, science doesn't say you're a girl. Science says biologically you are a male. Well, that's not, that's your truth. That's not my truth. So in one sense, society says so science is the ultimate truth. And then in another sense, society completely walks away from science. I'm like, what are you doing? You can't have it both ways, but that's what we believe today, that everybody's right, there's no wrong, everybody, whatever you think is fine, everything's going to be just perfect. Or you might say, it seems to me that this book is logically inconsistent. So now your logic is the ultimate standard of what is truth. There are things that I don't understand in the Bible that are clearly spoken of. How can Jesus be God? And how can God be Jesus and also the Holy Spirit? How do you have the Trinity? I don't understand it. I just know what it says. And if I use my logic as ultimate reason, you're not going to go anywhere. Because this book declares truth, and all of God's truth cannot be revealed in your mind where you completely understand it. So you will always, and I've used this example, I can take a thimble I can dip it in the ocean, and I can say, all the ocean is in that thimble. Well, everything that's contained in the ocean in one sense, in terms of its molecules and its makeup, is in that thimble. But is all the ocean in the thimble? No. That's what it's like trying to understand God. You dip a thimble into the understanding of who God is, and I understand what he's revealed, but God is so much more massive than that. I can't even comprehend it. So... And some people might say this, so my reason is the ultimate authority, my logic is the ultimate authority, or how about this, my experience is the ultimate authority. And they basically determine their reasons or their beliefs of truth on their experience. Now, experience is important. The Bible talks about experiences. However, that doesn't mean that it was true. You can have some pretty weird experiments or experiences in your life. So Sunday I had the wonderful privilege after we met in the park. Sunday was a day for me to prepare for a procedure medically on Monday called, yeah, you may <laughs> call a colonoscopy, right? And you got to drink that stuff. And so I come home from the Easter service. I'm pumped. I'm excited. Of course, my blood sugar is slowly going down. And my wife puts this spread on the table of ham and just, potatoes and just everything I love, you know, even those fresh croissant rolls, everything. And I'm just looking at it going, I can't have any of it at all. And because you got to fast all day. And so Monday I went in for my procedure and I was a little apprehensive because I never had one before. I didn't know what they were going to do. I, I, I mean, I knew what they were going to do. <laughs> I knew what they were going to do and I wasn't too 
I wasn't really wanting to go along with the program, if you know what I mean. So the anesthesiologist is standing over me, introduces me, tells me what he's going to do, and he, he says, I'm going to give you Michael Jackson juice. And I go, what's that? He goes, we call it propofol. And I said, okay. So I'm looking at the guy, and he just waves like that, and I don't remember anything after that. <laughs> but I woke up. Yeah. When I woke up, I got up out of bed and was like, whoa, what's going on here? I'm feeling the after effects of the propofol which are short, you know, because it dissipates quickly in your system, but I was having an experience right then and there. Th do I base my truth on that experience or, or an experience you might have? No, you can't, because your experiences are real, but it doesn't mean that they're always true. So, ultimately, the truthfulness of the Bible will commend itself as being far more persuasive than any other religious book, the Book of Mormon, the Quran, other books like this, religious books that have been written, the Word of God will still stand and has stood the test of time. Amen? Oh, yeah. So number one there is my reason is the ultimate authority. Number two is my logical consistency is the ultimate authority. What page is that on, Scott? I, I, the next... Okay, on the, on the next handout, I did put page numbers on there to help you, to help me, because I can... Under, under number five. And the third one is my human sensory experiences. So first one, my reason is the ultimate authority. Two, logical consistency is my ultimate authority, or my human sensory or human experience is my ultimate authority. Make sense? Questions? Okay, so here's a here's a point. And I, uh, why don't I? Where where are where are the? Uh, make sure. I get, yeah, I'll just grab this one here. Okay, just to make sure I'm with you guys. Okay. So, therefore, next page over, it requires the work of the Holy Spirit overcoming the effects of sin to enable us to be persuaded that the Bible is indeed the Word of God and the claims it makes for itself is true. So, though we're saying, yeah, the Bible claims to be the Word of God, and it is the Word of God, and it sounds like a circular argument. It is, in one sense, but it's not your typical circular argument because it is backed up by everything that we know historically, everything that is accurate. Thousands of prophecies have been fulfilled. I mean, you look at the book of Daniel when he even talks about Nebuchadnezzar's empire, and then he talks about the Medio persian Empire, and then the Babylonian Empire, and then the Roman Empire, all written hundreds of years, centuries before those empires even came into existence. And we know even the prophecies concerning our Lord Jesus Christ have been so clear that looking back on it, we now see, aha, this is true. Obviously, it's God's word. So this is not to say that our knowledge of the world around us serves as a higher authority than Scripture, but rather such knowledge, if it is correct knowledge, continues to give greater and greater assurance and deeper conviction that the Bible is the only ultimate truth of authority and any other the competing claims for authority are false. So, you know, when you're talking to somebody, what is their ultimate authority? What do they say to you or try to reason with you to discredit what you're saying when you share the gospel? Y yes, absolutely. So... When you're looking at how somebody gets saved, okay, you have, you have the human soul that the Bible tells us is lost, right? In fact, the Bible uses a very good word for it. Do you know what the word is? Right? We're dead in our trespasses and sins. If somebody's dead, what, what do I do? Do I take them to the hospital? 
So I walk in the ER and I say, hey, you, got, you guys, you got to hurry up. Get outside. This guy's dead. That's ridiculous. He's dead. What can, what can they do? Nothing. They, they, they would tell me, hey, the morgue is down that way. Go, go over to Kill Nicolay and drop him off because we can't do anything. He's dead. So here's what has to happen. If you're dead, God has to secondly quicken, right, open your eyes so that you can begin to see the truth. And how did Jesus express this? A lousy E. As you can see, I'm not a very experienced chalkboard writer. How does, how, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, what does he say? Right. And what, what, is, what is the word born again mean? Right. Born from above. Which means the Spirit, God's Spirit, takes the Word of God and comes and impinges upon the hearts of man and gives me the ability to see what is being said in God's Word and brings conviction to me. And this ability to see actually is an ability for me to be brought to life. The Bible used this as to quicken, right? Are you familiar with that old King James version? To quicken. So I'm dead. I can't understand anything. The aid of the Spirit comes and quickens me, enables me to see, and then ultimately I can respond in what? Faith. But if you are dead without the energy and the work of the Spirit, you're never going to be able to come to faith. Yeah. A little what? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, ultimately, it is God's Word that makes us alive to be able to see the words of God in order to believe. Now, we'll cover more of this because there's actually 10 different things that happens when somebody gets saved. There's a whole order of salvation in terms of what takes place in order for someone to come to know Christ. How do you tell them about hell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So, how do you tell them about hell? I, I, one of the ways that I would do that is simply this, you know, that you're not the one that's saying you're going to hell. You've got to be careful about that because then at that point you come across as being better than them, and that's not what you're saying. You can say God's Word says for all those who are in unbelief and do not believe are condemned already, and God will judge them. Now, I'm not your judge. I'm not saying I'm your judge. But what I am saying is that someday you're going to stand before God and be judged. And the outcome of that judgment is going to be heaven, which is a place in the presence of God, or hell, which is a place that's removed from the presence of God. And that place is described in the Bible as a terrible place of suffering and torment. Yeah, so, you know, I don't try to sugarcoat it. I do explain it, but... I try to answer whatever questions they have, you know, and they say, well, I don't believe it. I just simply said, well, let's go back to the point. What is your ultimate source of authority? And for you, your ultimate source of authority is what you think and what you believe. And what you think and what you believe doesn't matter compared to who God is because you're not God. You're a created being. You were made in his image. You are a fallen being created being just like me who is desperately in need of a savior so you follow the logic of what they're saying and ultimately they're trying to say no i don't believe this i reject this completely but i but i i i also when i witness to somebody that's not the first point that i start off with i don't say hey i'm mike how you doing hey you're going to hell yeah. just thought i'd let you know Yeah, yeah, yeah. Questions? 
So, I mean, ultimately there is God's judgment and you let, and you let men know that they're going to stand before God. And usually, see, what we are experiencing today in today's world is justification, not by faith, but justification by death. And so the way they look at it is this. Oh, after the person dies, they look at his life. He was a good dad. He was a good father. He loved his wife. He was a good worker. He contributed to our society. So he's got to go to heaven, right? Look at all those things that he did, right? But that's not what determines where we go. It's, you know, again, we go back to this idea of if my good outweighs my bad, right? Listen. God doesn't grade on a curve, right? You remember those days in t school when you took a test and the teacher said, okay, anybody who got 80 points or 85 points and higher, I'm grading on a curve is going to get an A. And then the second grouping of people, they get a B and then a C and then a D. No, God's standard is absolute perfection. And Yeah, yeah. It, you know, his standard is absolute perfection. And if you don't have absolute perfection... I got some really bad news for you. One infraction of his law. In fact, we even say this in society. Well, nobody's perfect. Right? How many times have you heard that? Nobody's perfect. Yeah. And that's exactly the point. Nobody's perfect. You mean to tell me you have, you have done everything, every thought, every motive, every action, Every decision that you have done and made has been in alignment with God's word and your life is literally perfect. You've never gotten mad. You've never, got, you've never stolen. You've never committed adultery. You've never lusted in your heart. You've never, just go down the Ten Commandments. And it's like, wow, because the Ten Commandments point out to us our inadequacies, don't they? Point out our sinfulness. And it's only through Christ that he redeems us not by the works of the law, but by what Christ has done in fulfilling the works of the law that we may receive his righteousness. Yep, John 3, 35, 36. Tell them to go or invite them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, we are experiencing right now, and this is, by the way, across the board. We are... Oh, the question was, is how do we get them to go to church? Once they're saved. Well, first of all, if they truly are saved, they're, yeah, they're going to want to be in the fellowship of God's people. They're going to want to make that decision and be involved in the body. The idea of being saved and not interested at all in church, those two do not connect. So you can be saved and maybe not understand the commandment to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, Hebrews 10.25. You may not be understand that, but once you begin to understand the truth of that, then you realize, I need to be in obedience. And you're telling me that you're loving Jesus. Jesus says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. How come you're not keeping his commandments? Then my question is, is do you love Jesus? And that's the ultimate question, isn't it? Do you love Jesus? I mean, you can do all that stuff, but the ultimate question is, is do I love you, Lord? Am I following you? In fact... It is Jesus himself, and this is what we have today. We have the idea of Jesus. I love Jesus over here and everything that he represents, but I can't stand the church. You say, well, why can't you stand the church? Well, there's a lot of problems in the church. Yeah, that's because you're there. That's why there's problems is because we're all people on the journey of sanctification at the church who are always striving to become more and more like Christ, but the reality is, is that we're human beings, including the pastor, who was a fallen sinner saved by grace, who is trying to continue to walk to be more like our goal, Jesus Christ. Yes. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. That only Christians can be more like him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 he rejected it. Christianity based on the fact of how he was treated in England when he was there for his education and he was looked down upon, he was uh, mocked and scorned and uh, treated with uh, racism because of the color of his skin and other things and he walked away saying, how in the world could, did you Christians classify yourself as Christians? Right? Now, 
it would have been appropriate for him to say, I believe in Christianity, I believe in the truth of the gospel, and then go to preach to the church to get the church to conform to what the word of God says. But that's what we're trying to do every week we preach, are we not? Trying to get you to understand what the text says and obey the text. Yeah. And, and not only am I trying to get you to obey it, I, I got to sink it into my life too. And it's got to go through me. And I, I feel like, okay, these are issues that I got to work on as well. Okay, where was I going? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when I, if I point my finger out there, I remember all these fingers I got pointing back at me. Right. So, therefore, it requires the work of the Holy Spirit coming and overcoming the effects of sin to be persuaded that the Bible is indeed the Word of God. Amen? All right. Ah. Where, did I, where am I? This does not imply dictation from God as a means of communication. So not, what I'm talking about here is how did we get God's word? How, how did God give it to the men who wrote scripture? So you have God up here, right? And he is now going to give the word of God to Paul, to Moses, to any of the writers of scripture. And how does this process work? How does this go to here? And there are several theories. One theory is dictation that God simply says, Paul, this is what I want you to write. Boom, 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 boom. And he writes that down word for word. But that's in some places of Scripture. There are some clear examples of God dictating the very words of Scripture to Paul or to whomever. For instance, he says in the book of Revelation to the angel of the church, write, and he spells it out. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. Many, many times. But God has spoken in a lot of different ways. Sometimes he gives a dream. Sometimes that are taking into account his vocabulary, his training, his understanding. And yet God is sovereignly controlling the outcome of the word of God by using the man of God and his personality and everything that he does and who he is. So you will have, for instance, John writes in a certain style. That's because God isn't necessarily dictating everything. He's telling him what he wants to write through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is using his personality and his gifts, and he writes the Word of God. And so we can look at the various authors of God's Word, and we can see the process by which God has used the Spirit for him to write the Word of God. Also look at this, Luke chapter 1. Turn there for just a moment. Luke chapter 1. He says this, Insomuch as many have undertaken to compile, this is Luke writing, a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, just as they were delivered to us by those from the beginning who were what? Eyewitnesses. So here, the Holy Spirit is being used, and Luke, the author, is interviewing people and talking to them about what they saw the Holy Spirit is giving testimony to Luke. The people who were eyewitnesses are giving testimony to Luke. And Luke is writing under the control of the Holy Spirit and giving to us the historical reality and giving to us all the context of God's Word. And it is written in such a way. And that's the process by which we say the Word of God is inspired. That's how it works. It isn't that the guy just turns into a robot and God says, Write the letter T. Next word, H. E. The. Second word, no. He uses us in this way to ultimately produce the inspired word of God. That is absolutely incredible to me. What would it have been like to, to be one of the, you know, like a Paul to, to actually write scripture like that? Right, right. 
Right. So later on when we talk about how we got the Bible, um, if you want me to talk about that, I can give you the historical process of the scriptures being written, being confirmed by the church, and then ultimately the church producing a standard or what we call a canon that basically said these books are the word of God. Now, there are a lot of historical books that are written at the time that are not God's word. And it's pretty plain when you read them. But we have the writings, and the sacred scriptures, because you've got to ask yourself the question, okay, what books do you put in? What books do you put out? And what's the reason why? Yeah. So the question is, is what do you do with people who say they get direct revelations from God? So here's my, my follow-up question would be to them, define your term. What do you mean by revelation? Explain that to me. Yeah, well, then I would say, what do you mean God speaks to you? Do you hear an audible voice? Well, I, okay, so but I'm going to say this is what I would say to them to follow up. Do you hear an audible voice? Okay, so assume, assume the answer is yes. Yeah. So I would simply say to them, if they're hearing an audible voice, God does not speak in an audible voice that way to you to give any type of new scripture. Because the canon of scripture has been closed for 2,000 years. So I'm not sure what you're saying and I want you to articulate more to me what you're saying by I hear God because we use that term kind of loosely, don't we? And we could be talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in my life where I read a verse of Scripture, and, you know, I've said this before. I've read this passage of Scripture, and, man, God was really speaking to me, and he told me this about it. Well, all I'm doing is giving you what the Holy Spirit has laid upon my heart from what I read in the God's Word. But if I come back here and I say, the Holy Spirit told me this, that there's 12 commandments, not 10, and here are the last two. Well, you got you to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right? So then I would say, yeah, no. I'm not going to add up. Uh-huh. becomes a mess. It just becomes an absolute mess. If this isn't the authoritative word of God, then, you know, anything that you say that is contrary to this, I mean, I know that's not of God, because this is the standard. Now, did, does God lay impressions upon our heart, and we say things like, God told me, or I heard, I heard God speaking to me? Yeah, he does that through the power of the Holy Spirit. He'll lay something on my heart right? Yeah. It's the internal, again, that word, internal testimony of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is active and working, right? But if you come up to me, and you, you're, let's say you're a young man, and you've met this girl, and she's absolutely beautiful, and you're in love with her, and you want to marry her, and you come and you say to me, hey, God wants me to marry her, right? This is God's will. You, okay. And I sit down, and we have a conversation together, and you're a believer, and she's not a believer, and you're telling me that this is God's will, I'm going to point to you in Scripture and say, wait a minute, you're unequally yoked. That's, you know, she first needs to become a believer in order for you to determine whether or not you should be married together. Now, some of you may be married to an unbeliever right now, and I'm, I'm not saying then go home and tell your wife, I'm out of here. You're an unbeliever. No, the Scripture tells you to remain as you are, to stay as you are and continue to live your life for God, and you're hoping that someday God is going to open her eyes to see the truth and come to faith in Jesus Christ. Yes. So what they're doing is 
they're backing off of the statement of Ellen G. White and yes. saying that. That's why I love the Adventist Church. Okay, so you grew uh, up. You grew up Seventh Day Adventist. No, I grew up Adventist. So Twelve years I was part of the Adventist Church. In fact, I have a ministry there right now. Okay. So I need to leave, but it's not in front of that. Get the stones out, guys. Get the stones out. I'm so encouraged. Yeah, right. Yeah. So are, are you are you a Seventh-day Adventist? No. Okay. But you have a ministry there. Yes. What do you do? Uh, I teach Sabbath school. Wow. What When you teach Sabbath school, is that, um, are you teaching, what's the curriculum? Is it their curriculum? Yes. Okay. Right. And in fact, it's occasionally in the curriculum. Okay. But I don't talk about that. I skip over it. Well, good for you. Good. Okay. Well, thank you, my brother. Appreciate that. Yeah. My first experience as a pastorate, I, w I took over this little church in Southern California, and the church had just had a terrible split. I was on staff, and so they fired the senior pastor, and I was the next guy in line, and they said, okay, you're, you're it. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to get fired. <laughs> but um, so I had a, this couple come that were new to the church. And, and when, you, when you walk in, you don't know everybody. And she said, we are so excited to be here. We love the preaching. We love the teaching of God's word. We think God's calling us to children's ministry. And we want to serve in children's church. Okay, great. And so she began, her and her husband, to serve in children's church. And one of my kids brought home a pamphlet that they had handed out. And they were Jehovah Witnesses. They, they had infiltrated and saw this as an open door to propagate their stuff. And that's what they were doing. So I went to her and I said, excuse me, is, 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 are you realize this is Jehovah? Oh, yes, we're Jehovah Witnesses. And I said, I'm sorry, uh, Jehovah Witnesses is not on the same page as we are in regards to the truth of God's word and who Jesus is. Thank you for coming. I'd love to share the gospel with you, but you cannot continue to teach children's church. You can continue to come to church and sit under the preaching of God's word, but you cannot teach the kids. <laughs> so that I bet I, our vetting process really bumped up really high after that. So, yeah. Questions, guys? Questions about anything? Yep. And what is his role, right? He's got a role. He's got a dog on it. Right? right. He wants to rule the world. Right. And I think he's smart enough to realize that we're all standing out on the same page. So, and brings the, the canon set the people together. Right. To make a decision as to how he, I think, Right. That, that he would then, through that, be able to You'll, rule. Yeah. Not conquer the world, but yeah. rule. Right? Right. Because now we've all got the same enemies. Right. So, so in, in one sense, it's good that he brought Christianity to the empire. In another sense, it's bad because Christianity, when you start getting that all confused with politics, it can become a real mess because the kingdom of God is God's kingdom and it's not of this world. There'll be an ultimate kingdom yet to come. And you can't force anybody to become a Christian. You can't put a knife to their throat and say, believe or confess in Jesus or I cut your head off. That's, that's not this right here. You're still dead and yeah, you can still cut their head off, but they ain't going to heaven, right? And so it's, it, one thing is good that the universality of Christianity is recognized within the kingdom, but you can't force anybody into the kingdom. They have to believe. They, they have to obey. They have to have their own faith. And we have to be careful as believers here because I do not want us to try to shove Christianity down people's throats politically. 
And so what I, what I mean by that is, yes, there are a group of people that came here in 1620 called the Pilgrims who came here to actually establish religious freedom. But you have to remember that everybody that came on that boat in the Mayflower wasn't a believer. There was about 20 or 30 sailors that didn't know the Lord and continued to live in this land because Jesus says you're always going to have the good seed and the bad seed growing up together. You're going to have wheat and tares. And you can't come around and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Now, I'm not saying don't vote for morality. I'm not saying don't vote for the president or the congressman or the elected official that, you know, you want to uphold Christian values. You want to see standards. I want to see an end to abortion. I want to see um, human life respected and people loved. But at the same time, I can't sit there and say, therefore, America is completely a Christian nation. It's not. Were many people who founded it Christians? Yes. Did they believe in God? Some of them did. Some of them believed in God. They were deists, but not all of them were. So that's why you don't, you, you won't see me talking about political candidates as much as I talk about a political issue, like right to life. So I don't know if I answered your question or not, Lars. Crusades, you know, they were crusades that went over to the Holy Land because they thought the Holy Land should be conquered in the name of Jesus Christ. And they went over there and they slaughtered thousands of people and the crusaders were wiped out all in the name of Jesus. Ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Are we really living? Yeah. Amen. Listening. Listening. Oh, I'm sorry. Listening. Okay. Guys, we'll stop right there. Okay. Is this helpful? Yeah. Okay. Yes, you get to keep those. Yeah, we want to preach the truth and live the truth. And I'm not saying if, if, if God's given you a heart for politics and you want to be a politician, good. Be a politician and have a Christian influence. Yeah. Yeah, we don't want to form unholy alliances. And that's the problem when you get behind some candidate who is maybe morally on your side but doesn't know the Lord at all never know. Let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truthfulness of scripture. Help us, Father, to understand more. And as we write these words of scripture, Father, and as we read them, you wrote them. As we read them, may we be convinced more than ever that this is your word. And help us to completely obey everything that you, Father, are saying to us through your word. Give us discernment of the spirit. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming, guys.